Celebrations now, come on. Why am I so happy? Why could I be so happy? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because my book, The Gallipoli Evacuation, is now available to buy. Hooray! Forget all that and pre-ordering. Forget all that. You can actually buy it. You can buy it all over the world through the wonders of the internet. You can pay in a wide range of currencies and all you have to do is go to our website which is livinghistorytv.com. Livinghistorytv.com. You know it makes sense. Buy today. A Living History Production. I'm Peter Hart, and for the last 40 years, I've interviewed thousands of veterans about their experience of war. Join me on a journey through the pages of history. Welcome to Peter Hart's Military History. Hi, and welcome to Peter Hart's Military History Podcast, thingies. Uh, I'm with Gary Bain, and we're post-lockdown, aren't we, Gary? Here I am at your lovely home, and I have to say, I love what you've done with the place. Uh, I'm sat in your living room. The Fred the farting dog's here. Uh, there's a lovely, friendly fly, and it's just lovely to be here, Gary. Lovely. Yeah, I think we should say, Peter, that we're socially distancing. But I do think that measuring out the two meters in that way was quite unique. Well, well that's a bit strange, especially as I was wearing my fluffy knob at the time. Yeah, I'm really pleased with my fluffy knob. Thank you for that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, you know how strict Matt is about uh, extraneous noise, Gary. <laughs> yeah, I'm slightly <laughs> concerned that the uh, the fluffy knob's, knob's too big for the microphone. Yes, it does seem to be. Perhaps I, perhaps I overestimated the size. Uh, but there you go. Um, what are we doing today, Gary? Tell me, tell me, because uh, I, I like to hear from your own sweet lips what we're doing. Well, today, Peter, we're going to be looking at the conditions at Gallipoli throughout the whole campaign. Uh, so we're not going to be concentrating on any individual actions today. It's just what it was like to be there, what the living conditions were, what the rations were, and uh, the logistics around you know, maintaining an army in uh, such difficult circumstances. Put my teeth in, Peter. Circumstances. <laughs> your teeth. Is, you've got a gap in your front teeth that you didn't have when uh, when I last saw you, by the way, Gary. How, well, can you uh, just fill in the background there, or do you want to fill in the tooth? No, I'm just creating a gap for somewhere to keep my cigar. Ah, well, plutocrats are like that. The, the, the thing to remember about Gallipoli, it, it's completely different from the Western Front, because on the Western Front, a unit would be in the front line for... Th- three days perhaps, perhaps in the support three days and then out in reserve three days. And every so often they'd go right out of the line on, on rest periods. Uh, and there was a sort of routine. Uh, 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 and, and that doesn't happen on Gallipoli, uh, uh, does it? No, I mean, you've got to think about the, the physical conditions. You've got to think about the remoteness of it. I believe it was about 800 miles from uh, from Alex, and I don't mean Alex Churchill. It's uh, uh, Everyone wants to be 800. Everyone wants to be 800 miles from Alex Churchill. And uh, you had beaches, you had railway, you had depots originally set up, and, you know, the piers, the wharfs and the stores, and they had to build everything. Because it's the, the, the so-called beaches, aren't they? They're, they're not yes. really, they're not, it's not a port, is it? No. Uh, the whole place is isolated. It's, it's, it's 800 miles from Alex as the, the nearest port that they, they can use. Uh, but it's also 12 miles from Imbros, and that, where there's another makeshift harbour and depot. And it's 60 miles from, uh, from Mudros. And you've got to remember that nowhere on the whole peninsula did they advance more than a few miles. So they, they were literally clinging onto the peninsula which uh, which in turn means that everywhere's under fire and so you you can be killed at any time i think we'll, we'll, we'll i think we'll start with having a look i mean the logistics of gallipoli are, are fascinating uh, i used to say that it was logistically impossible and then our good friend rob thompson used to correct me as he so often does he dear dear darling rob as, as he as you call him uh he um he pointed out that it must have been possible or they wouldn't have done it. All right, Rob. <laughs> All right, it's very difficult uh, because they're so far away. Um, because they're, they're, what, 1,500 miles from, from, from England. Um, the, the Australians are thousands of miles away. The New Zealanders from their, their home base. Um, the, 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 it's so remote and, and that they did create their own depots, their own ports, their own harbours, if you like, makeshift and not very good. 
Uh, I think we'll start with looking at what food they had. Uh, the British Army uh, prides itself on its ability to, to feed its men. And uh, you sit before me, a testament to that in the past they've fed you well and kept you, kept you strong and uh, growing in size. Uh, <laughs> you're looking at me strangely. <laughs> um, so uh, let, let's have a, a, look, a look at uh, what rations were issued to, to the men. What do you think the main ration was for the British Army in, at Gallipoli in 1915, Gary? Have a, have a guess what the main constituent would be. Sex. No. <laughs> No, there's no ration sex to the British Army. Oh, in that case, then, it would be bully beef, the, the, the next best thing. <laughs> the next best thing. What is bully beef, Gary? Well, today, people would think of it as corned beef, I think, uh, would be the best description of it. Uh, usually, it came in a, uh, a tin with a little key for opening. Still um, does. But, to, you know, one, one of the drawbacks to being in Gallipoli was um, it very often could be poured from the tin, uh, as it had turned to liquid, because uh, you had no way of keeping the thing cool and uh, and the heat and, uh, and would have an impact on it. It's a very fatty form of meat, uh, so liquid. It, uh, and of course, it would be. Was it? Is it sort of uh, appropriate to the climate? Do you think? Or is it? Is it uh, not, not not too salty or anything? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it, it clearly was. Um, a, you know, nowadays we talk about a fight the day and having a balanced diet. It certainly wasn't a balanced diet. Um, it would be su- uh, supplemented by biscuits, which they refer to as dog biscuits. Now they're nutritionists, aren't they? Uh, are they uh, are they easy to eat when you perhaps in an absence of water? No, I mean you mentioned the gap in my teeth. That's because I've tried to eat a dog biscuit. <laughs> um, Fred, <laughs> has he been eating your biscuits again? Oh. No, I mean they they were. They were rock hard, frankly, um, and, and very difficult to eat. Um, nutritionists, sir. They, yeah, they, actually, yeah. they, they are nutritionists. Aren't and, they? you know, they got other things. There was there was bread, which, uh, you know, could be made locally. Bakery Beach, yeah. uh, which we haven't been to. We've not uh, been to. Let's go there next time. Uh, jam is, is, is often uh, mentioned in, in reports and uh, uh, contemporary records, and it was always apricot jam. Which is weird because on the Western Front it's plum and apple, as as, as I think everybody would know. Uh, but but at, at Gallipoli it's apricot. Now apricot, there's a famous Simpsons episode where uh, uh, the Simpsons, those yellow people, Gary, they, although they look a bit like you, Homer does anyway. Uh, the, the the thing about it, the, the premise of the episode was that everybody knows that uh, that that. Uh, broccoli is poisonous and I feel the same about apricots uh, the idea of apricot jam as the only form of jam is just ridiculous uh, and one of the great things that the lads used to say was that if they ever got a tin without a, uh, a label on it it was strawberry <laughs> and they they cast foul calumnies among the against the army service corps who they accused of stealing all the strawberry jam and just leaving this bastard uh, apricot jam. Apricot jam is not appetising in hot weather on well, dry biscuits. I don't know why they didn't think of it, Pete. If you just took the label off, <laughs> it would become, it would become <laughs> strawberry jam. Oh, they, they didn't think it through, did they? Now, what, what else? What other things are good for uh, chaps, or perhaps in in a, in a hot climate? Um, well, one thing, well, you know, if you if you if you want, you know, uh, made to make your mouth water stuff. So, made to make your mouth water, bacon. <laughs> <laughs> That's not salty, is it? No. Uh, cheese. Now, come on, cheese. That's a bit of cheese. Does that make your mouth water? Uh, and they get their tea and sugar. Of course they get that. Um, so, so, so this is the sort of rations they got. Um, now, wealthy officers, do you think there was any option for them? Well... They could get a little extra, Peter. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> we're not going in. We're not going there, Gary. <laughs> but they used to club together, didn't they? And they used to send home for luxury items. I, I remember seeing advertisements from uh, some of the the most notable shops in in London about uh, uh, sending things out to the troops and things like that. So they used to send for hampers and Fort, stuff. Fortnum like that. and Masons. Fortnum and the Masons, yeah. I was trying not to advertise, but... Oh, yeah, but... God, no, I'm, I'm on a retainer with Fordham <laughs> and Mason, so... Uh, uh, ching! <laughs> um, 
Yeah. Um, now, the ordinary soldier, do you think he got things for foreign relations? <laughs> no, no, but uh, they did get parcels. And, and while we were doing the research, I came across um, an article that was written by former Home Secretary Alan Johnson, who himself had been a postman, I think, in his, in his earlier career. And his, he did an article for the BBC in 2014. And he says that the Boer War of 1899 had established the expectation by the soldiers that they'd get mail you know they'd be able to keep in touch with home the first world war provided a challenge on an unprecedented scale and he says that at its peak the postal service was dealing with an extra 12 million letters and a million parcels each week going backwards and forwards to the soldiers and that in gallipoli there were more unopened letters uh, being returned from those that were killed or missing uh, than were being sent to the front, and that the GPO had the unenviable task of ensuring that any return letters did not arrive back with the loved ones before they got the official telegram. Uh, it's, it's a remarkable feat of works. It, it is amazing. Uh, the, the, uh, the, what, what, would, what would people put in a parcel? So you're doing your parcel. What would you send out? You don't know how long it's going to take. No. Uh, I, th- I think you've. I think gazing at my note here, I see that you've you've found, you've got a lovely quote, which I think I used in a book as well because I recognise. Take me through. It, it's just a, about a bit of a cock up, wasn't it? Yeah. So, so this, who are you going to be? You're going to be Pro- Private Harold Thomas of the Third East Anglian Field Regiment, RAMC. You are, aren't you? I am. And he says, um, I once saw a parcel consisting of cigarettes, good cake, good socks, good and soap. Yeah. Into the midst of which a bunch of a dozen bananas had been inserted some six weeks earlier when the consignment had been proudly dispatched from an enthusiastic but woefully (laughs) ignorant English homestead. That parcel would have been a good illustration for the phrase, the bondage of corruption. Even the socks seem to have surrendered to the general dissolution. I can just imagine it. Oh, that is fantastic. Um, They could get little bits, extra bits of uh, treats and things, Um, but uh, there was a problem. uh, And and actually, what we're talking here is that we've got a restricted diet, haven't we? Uh, they're, They're not getting a lot of fruit. And not getting a lot of vegetables, and that meant uh, that they start to get the usual skin problems. Uh, not exactly scurvy, perhaps, but uh, in the desert they call them desert sores. So if you scratch, if you've got a scratch or something, it would turn into sort of carbuncle type thing. Uh, quite unpleasant, quite nasty. Underlying all this is a shortage of water. Um, there is local water. Uh, uh, the biggest problem here was at Suvla, of course, where, which we've talked about when we were all actually sat on the plane, and. What people didn't realise was that 12 to 15 feet down, there's water everywhere. The point is, the ordinary soldier can't dig 12 to 15 feet down, so you're in a lot of trouble. The, the yeah, but we, I mean, we have seen, for example, uh, on one of the tours, I remember there was uh, a big metallic water container at the top of one of the, the, the cliffs. Uh, we've seen some constructions by the uh, by the engineers for for um, concrete based uh, water storage areas. Um, so there was water. You're absolutely right, but it was the logistics of getting it quickly to the troops. And bear in mind, as I said earlier, there was no more than a few miles advance anywhere. It, absolutely, uh, they they uh, they get that the water the water the local water is often supplemented by. Uh, uh, water brought in from Egypt. I'm not sure that's the best place to bring. I always thought, hang on, where would you fetch water from? I'm not sure Egypt would be the first person to spring to my mind. Has that you're making a certain gesture? It, does that mean that Fred's farted, uh, Gary? Yes, it does. Excellent. I'm glad he's near you and not me. I won't get it for a minute. Uh, talking of pollution, here's a, a quote from Lieutenant. Le- See how smooth that was going. They've never noticed that. Uh, Lieutenant Leslie Grant of the First Fourth Royal Scots, and he says this: We get liquid of sorts by digging a hole in the trench and letting it silt up. Of course, it has to be boiled, but even then, it's a colour of milk and as gritty as a grindstone. Tea takes the taste away a bit, but the men say that they can tell by the taste whether a Tommy or a Turk is. Bur- beside that particular well. I love that. Uh, that, That's the sort of cynicism that soldiers in action have. There isn't enough get the front line. And when we're at Gallipoli, we have bottles of water, don't we? We we refer to something being a one-bottle walk or a two-bottle or the boot. 
<laughs> six bottle walk. <laughs> um, there, they only had about often a pint a day. And I can't imagine July, June, July, August, September at Gallipoli with only that restricted amount of water. And later in the war, I mean, we visited the French sector last year when we went there and uh, there was a shared well between the, the French and, and the Turkish, much later in the war, but they, they had adopted a sort of live and let live attitude and, and you know, they take it in turns to go to the well. That is a great, that's in the valley, the Kerevsdare Valley. It's fantastic to go there, to think of them sharing that. That, and the well's still there, it's great. Um, now, the troops were filthy dirty. Uh, there's a lot of dust in the summer, they're dirty, they can't really bathe. Uh, uh, they can go to the beach, uh, can they? Sometimes they can. I remember one great quote from a bloke at Kirich Tepe at Suvla. He climbed 600 feet down to the sea, a lovely swim, felt lovely and refreshed. Then by the time he climbed up the 600 feet, he was as sweaty as a a sausage that's been left out in the sun for three days, which is pretty... Strange. And, of course, there there is nowhere that you are not at risk of artillery fire. So going to the beach, which is under artillery fire, getting to the beach, just going... It's all... Da- everything at Gallipoli is dangerous all the time. So it can, becomes a bit of a dust bar. One of the things, and we did have your friendly fly that you specially caught and released in the room... Yes. Uh, uh, so, so it could be atmospheric. It seems to have buggered off, probably because of Fred's farting. Fred's now doing something unpleasant with his genitalia. Can you hear that squelching, licking noise? Um, that's, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> that's not you, Gary, before we get banned from the air. The, uh, I want to talk about flies generally because they are a real problem and, and people don't understand. Now, you're going to be Private Harold Boughton of the 2nd 1st London Regiment. They're, they're attached to the 29th Division. Uh, let, let's have a look at what you've got to say here. One of the biggest curses was the flies. There were millions and millions of flies. The whole of the side of the trench used to be one black swarming mass. Anything you opened, a tin of bully, it would be swarming with flies. If you were lucky enough to have a tin of jam and opened that, swarms of flies went into it. They were all around your mouth and on any cuts or sores that you'd got, which all turned septic through it. Immediately you bared any part of the body, you were smothered. It was a curse. It really was. And it, it it's not just a curse. There's this idea that people notice where the flies have been. And all around them on the battlefield, their corpses. We'll come back to this, but it's it's part of the fly problem. So we'll do with some of it now. Uh, this is a quote from Abel Seaman Thomas Macmillan. By God, I've read his memoirs at the Imperial War Museum. He was a crotchety old bugger. Uh, <laughs> people say that veterans, they have this idea they're all nice. <laughs> These are miserable sod. Anyway, he says this. There was a group of Turkish dead in front of my fire step, and I observed that in almost every case the head was thrown back and the mouth wide open. Into the gaping mouths the flies poured, and out of the gaping mouths onto us they came. So there you go, onto us, onto your bully beef. onto, And you could see a putrescent, stinking corpse there, and the fly goes from that to, uh, to you. Now, um... One of the things uh, people often wonder which which is the mighty, the pen or the sword. And one bloke, uh, Sub Lieutenant A. P. Herbert of the Hawk Battalion, uh, he wrote a limerick. One of your favourite uh, fobs. You wrote a brilliant poem earlier in these sessions about Fred the farting dog, and now you're going to read uh, a limerick by A. P. Herbert, an intellectual of the highest order. There once was a man who said, "Why should I suffer the bites of this fly? I'm prepared to concede that it must have a feed." But let it be Gerald, not I. <laughs> terrible, terrible. Uh, Gerald is uh, an, uh, another another young officer in the uh, Hawk Battalion, and he wrote the history of the Royal Naval Division. Great bloke. A uh, little bit right wing for me, but uh, he's uh, he was in the, he founded the Right Book Club, <laughs> supporter of Mister Hitler, that kind of thing. But uh, he was uh, he was nice in 1915. Uh, the flies would be there till late uh, late November. But now we're going to switch to your your favourite topic, Gary. We're going to switch to talk about bottoms. Let's talk bottoms because this is the real thing, and and this is where the fly and the corpses and and the bottoms all sort of intermingle in the most unpleasant manner. Uh, the latrines at Gallipoli are. Uh, primitive they're either an open trench or if you are lucky you had a pole to, to you know supported by two cross poles and a, a, a cross pole at, where you just hung your ass over and let rip that's if you're lucky um 
What you're getting here is a perfect storm. You've got a terrible diet that's not good for you. You've got putrid corpses and you've got latri open latrines, completely open. And uh, this results in dysentery. Now, what, what, what spreads the dysentery? Well, here I'm going to read a quote by... There's just... Well, could I just say, there's, colloquially, uh, it was known as the Gallipoli Gallop, but I believe you refer to it as Bain's disease. I do refer to it as Bain's disease. That's because you got a slight stomach upset. <laughs> <laughs> which uh, and and I, I have long treasured the moment on the island of Imbros when there was in the middle of the plain uh, by Kefalos Bay there was uh, a single standing erect and alone this uh, this this latrine <laughs> and uh, you sort of ran to it in my and uh, to be honest my imagination has taken over a lot of it you sort of ran to it in a sort of desperate manner and then inside we heard a lot of banging and crashing and the, the awful moaning. <laughs> And there were birds flying away. <laughs> and you were in there about, for me, a couple of hours. <laughs> oh, and for me too. Uh, yes, Bain's disease. There was another uh, chap called uh, Bryn Hammond, good friend of mine, who never listens to anything I do. Uh, so he also, uh, we called it that Hammond's disease, but he, he said it was Bain's disease. But anyway, uh, this is uh, Sir Arthur Hurst. Uh, after all that silliness, uh, this is from his book, Medical Diseases of the War. And he said, as flies are much the most important means of spreading dysentery. Their two favourite articles of diet are faeces, that's shit, Gary, and jam. Is that marmalade? <laughs> no, that's apricot jam. <laughs> and so I, I always have this vision of your discerning fly. And you can imagine he's, he, your fly's out for a bit of a fly and he's flying around and I'm going to die, I'll die, I'm my lovely fly. Fly, fly, fly. Oh, oh, oh look at that body. And he goes, have a little swim in the scum and horrible gooey stuff on the, perhaps in their eyeballs. And then, oh, I don't know, fly, 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 fly. And then, what's that? A pile of shit. Hey, you slug. <laughs> and the fly goes in and he has a lovely swim <laughs> and then and then he comes out of there and he's had he's had his, his and then he sees apricot jam tin with a bloke trying to eat it <laughs> the trouble is that they get the di you get the dysentery from the ship it goes on to the jam sandwich you eat the jam sandwich you've got it and uh, it is terrible. This is uh, ordinary seaman Joe Murray, always a favourite of ours, uh, Gary, and he was in the Hood Battalion at this time. Uh, tell us, what, what is the result? And think back to being in that latrine, Gary. With dysentery, you keep on trying to discharge something, but there's nothing to discharge. It's only slime, just slime. No solids at all. Then, of course, we didn't have any toilet paper, and you had to wipe yourself with your hand. There's nothing else. Then you'd wipe your hand, originally on the grass, but grass was getting a bit short. Rub your hands on the sand and your trousers. And uh, the end result is, it's just terrible, isn't it? And you're going to be Private William Cowley now, Army Service Corps, 11th Division. You felt so weak with dysentery, you'd got no strength, you were as weak as a kitten. The doctor asked me one night how many times I went to the trains. I said, 16 times. You rush out there, and when you get there, you couldn't do anything. Well, you could when you rushed to it. I remember. <laughs> the, the noises, Gary, the noises. Um, so the trouble with it is, is gradually you, you get very... Di you, you, sometimes, it, he says you can't, sometimes you can't do anything, sometimes you can. You end up dehydrated. Uh, but Lance, Lance Corporal Alexander Burnett, 4th Royal Scots, uh, another quote giving you the idea. What's this one, Gary? You're not able to do anything. Not when it gets you as bad as that. You don't feel like doing anything. You just say, oh, let me die, I don't care. That was a superb Scottish accent. And you became all husky for a moment. Well, it was emotion. Now, um, gradually, people get, they start to lose control of their bodies. People say, oh, well, surely they could keep their buttocks clenched. But, you know, no, not, not, not. It's just awful. This is, uh, this is ordinary seaman. Uh, Steve, Stevie Moyle, uh, Drake Battalion R&D, he, he said this, 
they're talking about the latrines, just the trenches. If you'd looked in there, you'd have been sickened. You'd think they'd parted with their stomachs or their insides. It was awful. You had to cover it and dig another. It hadn't to be so high or else you could fall down. There were no supports or anything. It was just an open trench, but it was fairly deep. And 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 this this is the point. Nobody is uh, able. I mean, th- in, when we talked about the South Not Tazars, it's the same in either war. Remember that quote we talked about about the chap, the sergeant major who crawled yeah. to the latrine, leaving behind a trail of shit. Uh, and you think, and yet he was a, a sergeant major. Uh, 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 it's, it, it's dehumanising, for for want of a better word. Yeah, and you've got the worst quote in the world uh, by Joe Murray that uh, you're going to read now. Um, My old pal. A couple of weeks ago, he was as smart and upright as a guardsman. After about ten days, to see him crawling about, his trousers round his feet, his backside hanging out, all soiled, his shirt, everything was soiled. He couldn't walk. My pal got a hold of him by one arm. I got a hold of him by the other. Neither he nor I were very good, but we weren't like that. It's degrading, dragging him to the latrine when you remember how you saw him just a little while ago. We lower him down next to the latrine. We're trying to keep the flies off him. We were trying to turn him round, put his backside in towards the trench. I don't know what happened, but he simply rolled into this foot-wide trench, half sideways, head first into this slime. We couldn't pull him out. We didn't have any strength, and he couldn't help himself at all. We did eventually get him out, but he was dead. He drowned in his own excrement. And it's terrible to point out after a story like that, but he hadn't died drowned in his own excrement. He died in somebody else's excrement. It's just, and people often say, is that story true? Well, Murray is checkable. You can listen to him yourself on the Imperial War Museum website. Uh, Joe Mur- Joseph Murray, it probably is down, IWM, look it on. Um, there's 22 hours of it, so it'll take you a while. But he checks out for the most part. Did a lot of people die of dysentery, Gary, or is this the exception rather than the rule? No, I think this is the norm. I mean, if you you just got to think about what we said earlier about really poor diet, uh, the flies. Ah, uh, you, you misheard me. They, they all got it, but very few would die. If you see, what oh, I see what you mean. So, Sorry. Yeah, I, you misheard me. I just, uh, but yeah, you're right. Everybody had because the diet. It's the flies, isn't it? And presumably, you. <laughs> You, you had to keep going. You, you, you know, you, you couldn't go off to, to hospital for you know thousands and thousands of men if you had dysentery. It's just you know you got to carry on. They've got a battalion of what six hundred by then, uh, and and four hundred and fifty of them have got dysentery. You can't all go home of know. different degrees, of course. And and so that that you, you have to be really bad to get off with dysentery. And I, I, uh, joking aside, as well, you had. And we've joked about it a lot. You had a mild tummy upset, probably caused by eating the wrong thing or a bit of bad luck with with a dirty toilet door uh, handle. And I could think of the door handle it could have been. (laughs) Hello, that cafe by the sea. (laughs) That's a particularly salubrious uh, toilet door. Um, But the point is, that's not dysentery, is it? That that was an upset stomach. You were as right as rain after a day or two. Uh, yeah, but but while I was unwell, I found it difficult, for example, to to climb hills and things. Like that. I found it very difficult. You, you it, it's and that's not and dysentery is ten times worse. And you don't get better from dysentery unless you change the circumstances. And you do become extremely dehydrated, basically shit out all the liquid in you, and that may, leads to you, you you're dehydrated, aren't you? Uh, which can that does kill. Some people die. They don't normally fall into latrines and die. But this is part, just a part of a cocktail of diseases. Uh, now, what else have they got? Well, jaundice. Uh, now, jaundice, which is quite a serious disease, to them was just a bit of extra colour in the face. <laughs> Instead of being pasty white or burnt, <laughs> you know, that that they they they, they 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 were a bit yellow. Um, Paratyphoid. Now, you said to me before this started, I remember you saying, Pete, he said, there's nothing good about the word para. There is nothing you said. And you said you particularly wanted this drawing to the attention of all paratroopers who might be listening to this. <laughs> and that you would deal with them as and when they approach you. Do you remember saying that to me before this started, Gary? No, I think you misheard me in that case, Pete. I, what I actually said was there's nothing good that contains the word typhoid. Oh, a oh, complete misunderstanding. Paratyphoid. What is it then, Gary? What's paratyphoid? 
Well, it's a disease that that's spread from an existing sufferer. It, it, it's an infecting organism that uh, it could it could be in your excreta up to a year after you've had the illness, and it's a it's a short step from there, as you've mentioned, with the flies, the food, and the waters of others, and it's spread very quickly. I think there were about five thousand seven hundred cases, uh, and the symptoms included headache, stomach pains. You'll be surprised to learn diarrhoea. Uh, bronchial cough, large irregular spots, and a very high temperature, uh, which was associated with sweating. So clearly, when we went to the boot, I had it. Uh, <laughs> no, that that was your unfitness. <laughs> uh, no, it's not often fatal, but boy, was it debilitating. And prevention, once the disease was established, was pretty much impossible actually the flies yeah. I mean, so you can't you cannot stop them getting on your food if there are a thousand there's one fly in this room if there's a thousand million flies around they get on you as you waft them off your tea they're still getting in any liquid they're attracted to now uh, another other diseases well let's talk about malaria and people say there's no malaria at Gallipoli and you're yeah, really right uh, where did the 29th division come from Gary oh, they've been in India Pete is there malaria in India? I think there is. Is it a recurring disease? I believe so. Yes, Bob's your uncle. As, as, uh, is Bob your uncle, by the way? Uh, Derek. Oh. <laughs> Hello, Derek. <laughs> right. Uh, now, this all leads to one of those diseases that is very real, but isn't real. So we've got... Uh, the, the people often talk about uh, shell shock, and, the, and there's this whole snobbish idea. There is no such medical thing as shell shock. It's a it's a it's a collection of symptoms and 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 it PTD post traumatic stress symptoms, and soldier's heart is not a medical thing in one sense. It's it's basically cardiac disorder, soldier's heart, uh, due to strain, stress, um, lack of sleep. Um, toxic disease, yeah, to- toxemia. It's just awful. Um, and basically your body gets so buggered, to use a technical term, that it can't keep on going. Um, it, it, and what it happens is you get a disordered action of the heart. Now, this, is, this means that fundamentally you're a 22-year-old soldier, but your heart is behaving like a 90-year-old soldier, disordered action. If you try and go to the boot... I, it's like you were, you get a bit tidy, um, and me, and me, by the way, <laughs> before we started any macho, so I was tidy as well. Uh, but then, now, the thing is, you've got disordered action of heart, but you're a soldier, you're meant to be fit, you're meant to, for instance, the poor old 4th uh, Australian Brigade was sent on that flanking march on the night of the 6th of August. They were, some of them had dysentery, some of them had soldier's heart. Can you imagine what it was like? And I, I do remember interviewing the guys. They said, "Yep, I was sent. It, it got you sent off from Gallipoli. That would get you sent off eventually." And they used to say, "I, I had disordered action of the heart in 1915, and here I am. I'm 94, and I'm still here, and my heart's as solid as a rock." Anyway, so it was awful, awful physically, and this is the difference between. The Western Front. Uh, at the Western Front, there's no real dysentery fault. There's, there, there's constipation's more of a problem on the Western Front. Funnily enough, they had constipation at Gallipoli as well, occasionally caused by the bloody corned beef. What an awful place to serve. Blazing sunshine. Uh, you can't get out of it. it. It's just awful. But the thing is, they couldn't get away from it either. So at any moment, there could be... So there you are, in your, it's boiling up, and then suddenly you can get killed because anywhere at Gallipoli you can get killed. The stress factors are unbelievable. This isn't where, you know, you go to the front for five minutes, yeah, sorry, uh, three, two or three days, you're at the front all the time. When you're at the rest camp, you're still within artillery and possibly machine gun fire. Um, you have to sleep in the bottom of the trench. And this is uh, Lieutenant George Hughes of the 5th Dorsetshire Regiment. He said, there's so little room for the men to sleep in the firing line that they have to sleep on the firing step, many of them. And some actually prefer to lie at full length on the floor and put up with the kicks of the patrolling officer. <laughs> they never wake. I suppose a really tired man seldom does. And then morning, you get... What do you get in the morning? Still in the army now? Stand two. Stand two. What's stand two about, Gary? 
Well, basically, uh, it's anticipating that there's going to be a, an attack at dawn or first light. Um, and so it's it's getting everybody uh, on their toes, for want of a better word, anticipating that attack. So you've got the uh, they, they start up a 24-hour sentry rotor as well. The officers, of course, junior subalterns, uh, go around, and the NCOs, even more important, they actually know what they're doing, go around checking, checking, and, and they have the sentries. Uh, they, they, there's a big risk of snipers, especially as the Turks are often above. And so the average sentry, he doesn't look over the top a lot. What they do is have a quick look if they hear something, but mostly they're, they're just stood, ready, listening and occasionally peeking over, or they use periscopes. But do you know what? The, the, the periscopes, the Turks were good shots. They'd often put a bullet through the glass, which meant it would come down and, and, and possibly cut you. They're, this business, if there's no safe area, if you go swimming, wherever you are, you're just not safe. A shell could land any time, uh, any time. Uh, the big thing about Gallipoli, though, is there's not much Turkish artillery, not during the summer campaign. Later in the winter, they start to get it. Uh, and here's a quote from one of my all-time favourites, uh, Private Harry Baker of Chatham Battalion, R&D, and he gives an idea of what it's like when the occasional shell fire they got. You crouched as low down in the trench as you could, right flat down in the trench and as near to the parapet as you could because you hoped that any explosion would be behind. The ground used to rot and chunks of HE used to fly like cats meowing. So long as you heard the explosion, you were all right. If you didn't hear the explosion, you weren't there anymore. <laughs> he's, he's a great guy, uh, was uh, Harry Baker. Uh, the most famous, but there's guns all over the place. Uh, you always hear about Asiatic Annie, for, for, uh, you know, which is a, a, a collection of Turkish guns. Uh, they all had various names uh, given to them, Puking Percy, Asiatic Annie, and the rest of them. They're firing from the, across the straits from, from the Asiatic side. Uh, there's machine guns. Uh, and, and even at night, you have to be careful looking over the top because the Turks could have them firing on fixed lines. So they can just go past and press the button and it'll, uh, a stream of bullets will come across. Uh, they're an important part of the defence of both sides. One of the things that developed were hand grenades. Now, do you think they had proper hand grenades then? No, I mean, they refer to them as bombs. Um, and we've mentioned in previous podcasts, uh, they would be makeshift. So, for example, jam tins would be used. Uh, they'd be filled with all sorts of crap. Anything well, you, they'd you've get got a quote on. about this, haven't you? Uh, th- yeah. so who are, you're going to be Second Lieutenant Malcolm Hancock, 1st, 4th Northamptonshire Regiment. He was a great old boy. He was the president of the Gallipoli Association. I still remember. He was one of the first I ever interviewed. He was a wonderful old boy. Uh, so you be him. One was what we called a jam tin, into which was put a charge of explosive. It was filled with all kinds of odds and ends, bits of stone, flint, empty cartridges, bits of iron nails. Then a fuse was inserted into a detonator. The neck of the detonator was crimped together to hold the fuse into the detonator. It was put in through the top of the lid down into the explosive and then you've probably got four or five inches of fuse exposed. In order to use it, you would hold it in one's left hand and the thing was that to light the fuse you had to be darn careful not to show a light at night. I often would use the end of my cigarette. We were always smoking. That was very effective. Then, as soon as you heard it begin to fizz, you kept it for two or three seconds. Not too long, but not too soon either. You tried to get it to explode on landing. It wouldn't be in the air very long, and you had to try to get your timing right. You hoped it dropped into the Turkish trench. Amazing. Well, the trenches vary a great deal in distance between them. Uh, mostly 200, 250, 300 yards. Uh, it, it did narrow down to a couple of yards of places. There's a place like Quinn's Post. Yeah, we've seen it. Uh, up on Gully, Gully Spur as well at, at Helles. Uh, amazing. And uh, uh, they'd have listening posts sometimes out in no man's land. Uh, one of the things they have to do is constantly improve. They've always got work to do. Uh, so you have to improve the trenches, dig them deeper, more protection, perhaps try and create some sort of dugout uh, to, to repair shell damage. Uh, the bloody enemy will, will insist on the sandbags. You can, if you aim at the same point, you can cut and split them and gradually create a gap. So if somebody tall like yourself, Gary, goes past, they can put a bullet through the top two inches of their head. Um, the, oh, I don't know. Uh, the rest camps. Where were the rest camps? Well, they're back towards the beaches. Uh, and you have the most superb 
quote from uh, Major Norman Burge, Nelson Battalion, RND. He was a real humorist, he was. So what, what has he got to say about the rest camps? I've been puzzling why it's called a rest camp. The only solution I can think of is that some bullets hit the trenches and the rest come over to us. Ah, very amusing. I, I don't know. Uh, it, they're, 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 they're not necessarily times of relaxation. Does the army ever let you relax properly? <laughs> I'm not sure. So we've got a quote from uh, Abel Seaman Thomas Macmillan, uh, Nelson Battalion. Now, before we go on, uh, there's a phrase in this which is in bad taste. Uh, to the modern ear. Uh, I'm going to read it out simply because, uh, you know, he shouldn't have said it, but he, he's born in uh, 1880s, 1890 something, and we have a different attitude now. I'm going to read it as he says it, but uh, obviously we don't condone it. So he says this uh, Abel Seaman, Thomas Macmillan, Nelson Battalion, of working parties that seemed to be no end. Our division was kept on the trot so constantly that they became known as the white slaves of Gallipoli. Hmm. As a result of overwork, tempers went from bad to worse. I told you it was bad tempered. <laughs> As a result of overwork, uh, sorry, on being detailed for fatigues, groups, groups would sing aloud, even in the presence of the officers. Working, working, working. Always bloody well working. Working in the morning and working all day long. Oh. He sounds a bit like you at times, Gary. I know you never, ever complain, but there is a tinge about him that reminds me of you. And this would be followed by muttered curses, coarse and gross. Yep, it is you. <laughs> to, to demonstrate of this kind, our tolerant company commander turned a deaf ear. That's a bit like Matt, not, not editing, editing out all this crap from after the podcast. He's so kind. In these circumstances, how do you think the army amuses itself? The average soldier, amu- well, you know, Gary, it's funny little instance. And, and here, here we have Sir Patrick Duff, who was in 460th Battery, Royal Field Artillery. He said this, we killed a mouse today, Stavely having five shots at it with a revolver. The excitement was something frightful. If my British warm doesn't come, I'd better keep the skin. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. And uh, there was also, uh, I love this next quote, that it's a primitive form of propaganda warfare, I think. It's an early form of propaganda warfare, isn't it, Gary? Tell, tell us uh, what Private Harry Boughton used to do to an, a 2nd 1st London Regiment. What did, what did uh, Harold do to, uh, to upset the enemy? There were tons of tortoises, and sometimes we used to get them, make a little hole in the shell on their back, stick a piece of wood into it, cut a niche in the wood and put a piece of card in it with a rude message to Johnny Turk. We steered them off towards the Turkish trenches. I don't suppose they could read it, but anyway, it occupied some time. <laughs> oh, again, I think we have to apologise for this uh, to those of you who actually like animals and don't believe in carving owls in backs of tortoises, but there you go. That's the British Army for you. Uh, they'd write, writing homes, very important. I mean, even you, when you were a soldier, you used to, and you weren't in danger except from the uh, MPs, your officers, your, your wife, um, and anybody who knew you. And the beer uh, man. And the beer man for not paying your beer bill. Um, but you used to write home. Uh, soldiers love communicating with home. And this is a very touching little letter because cause this is, you're going to be Corporal Albert Fielder, Royal Marine Light Infantry, aren't you? Uh, read this quote. It's just something you wrote home. It's a letter at the War Museum. Always you are both in my thoughts. I think of you both in that little kitchen by yourselves. I know that you are thinking of me and wondering perhaps if you will ever see me come back again. Every night at nine o'clock out here, which is seven o'clock in England, I think that it is the boy's bedtime, and I always can picture him kneeling in his cot saying his prayers after his mummy. But cheer up, my scrumps, this will all end soon, and we shall be together again and carry on the old life once more. But we must have patience and not worry. And it's nice to note that he, he does. It just, it's lovely to note that he survives Gallipoli, isn't it, Gary? Yeah, but unfortunately he did die on the Somme in 1916. Yeah, sorry, we set that up for, for you. I mean, it, this is the reality of these terribly, terribly sad letters home. Um, I find that quite emotional. Back to corpses at Gallipoli, I fear. Um, uh, people often ask, why is it that the cemeteries, you've been there, 
the, the sort of cemetery like V Beach Cemetery is there's only about 20 actual known graves. The rest are known to be. Uh, uh, um, why do you think all this is? Um, there's casualties happening over. They're buried. What, what do you think? Why, 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 why is this? Well, I think, that, to my mind, there's only one uh, occasion where there was a sort of mutual truce to allow for the burials of bodies. So you can't just stop and bury the bodies. Um, it's unfortunate, but it's a reality. Um, you're you're under fire. You can't you can't do it. They you know. So they're just buried into the trenches area. They're buried into the or trenches, left in no or the artillery turns it over in no man's land. You, there is just no opportunity to to bury the dead. It just doesn't happen. So you don't know who they are. I mean, the one classic example of this is the neck, where the, those poor Australian and the Turks, by the way, who'd attacked earlier there, they're just laid in no man's land and they rot. Or Dead Man's Ridge. Why do you think it's called Dead Man's Ridge, Gary? There's, uh, there's, 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 um, a lot of bodies lying around. And one thing people talk about is you could smell Gallipoli, mild, a bit like Fred the Farty Dog. I shouldn't have introduced that levity into this, really, but a, but a little akin to uh, Fred. You could smell it long before you, you got there. Uh, it stank a, a horrible, horrible... And a lot of the veterans used to say that once you smelt that, smell of death you could never get it out of your nostrils in a way you could always sort of get it back and think about it uh, it's, it's awful smell of corruption swollen up corpses maggots they're often built into the parapet uh, you may remember that quote from murray about the 4th of june that we did in a previous podcast on the, the the 4th of june battle and and he talks about the maggots coming out of the corpses and swarming around and yeah, and soldiers would do really morbid things. So, you know, they'd shake hands where there would be a hand sticking out through the side of the trench. They would, as they'd pass, they'd shake the hand. Um, or if it was a head, they'd sort of pat the bald head. It, it, it's just, you know, it's part of how they coped with it, I suppose. I know one bloke, uh, it was a bald Turkish chap, and they wrote R.I.P., <laughs> rest in peace, uh, which is a horrible, um, insensitive horrible thing to do but it shows uh, what does it show it shows that the soldiers have become dehumanized they've become yeah they're immune to it and it's it, it you mentioned right at the start this is home so this is part of their home um it's just the norm for them by this stage they're, they're acclimatized to it that it is their home that's you're spot on there now let, let's have another qu- quote let, let's talk about <clears throat> personal morale and f- I quite like this quote because it's from the Joker, uh, Norman Burge. And he is a Joker. And, and, and he, this is a wonderful quote from him. And you're going to read it. And it, it's where for, he's, in, he's writing home and then suddenly he gets serious, doesn't he? It's still got flashes of humour, but fundamentally he's being serious. I've been rather trying to analyse one's feelings at different times and find it very difficult. Mostly, I think one doesn't have any feelings to speak of, and yet at other times you sort of look at things in a light you'd be rather ashamed of. That is, if you didn't happen to know that all the other fellows are feeling just the same. I know they do, because I asked them, and they said they did. So each of us was quite happy to find the others had nervous moments. For instance, on a Monday down here in the rest camp, you hear there's going to be a night advance of 100 yards. On Tuesday, on Tuesday morning, a sinister message all about stretchers and where the dressing station will be at comes in, etc. And also what part of the line will be in and so on. I don't mind confessing that for a moment one feels as if you hadn't had your breakfast. Sudden flashes of awful horrors one can picture only too easily intrude themselves on one's mind in a most insistent way. The uncomfortable feeling generally comes on when you know you've got to do something at a certain hour and you are just sitting down waiting for the clock to strike, as it were. That feeling again stops with a click directly you begin doing it, whatever it may be, and from then on you cease thinking how absurdly inadequate government pensions for widows are and mild wonders as to how the world can possibly get along without you and all that sort of morbid nonsense. And isn't that interesting how that letter, that, that letter changes mood? And you could see at the end, he's obviously thought, um, and goes to his normal sense of humour. Uh, I think that's a very, very touching, uh, t- touching letter. And th- th- there are problems with morale uh, at Gallipoli. There, there, there are a lot of people go, 
they, they get they get upset. Yeah, and I think it's also worth mentioning at this state, you know, cramped unsanitary, unsanitary conditions, noise, shell, lack of sleep, no rest, death injury all around you. It's not just physical problems. That's going to cause psychological issues as well. Terrible psychological issues. I have a book of a, a chap at, uh, who was uh, working at Malta in the hospital at Malta. And he, he was in charge. He was a hypnotist. And he reckoned he could cure any any. PTSD symptoms. They weren't called that then, obviously. Uh, but the people who came in, some of them had forgot, couldn't speak. Some of them had lost lost their sight. It's all psychological. Uh, other people twitching, manic twitching, uh, screaming suddenly, just like that. <laughs> just people had lost people who lost control of themselves. Um, and it's to me, it's all totally understandable reaction to being under that sort of mental pressure for that length of time. It's this isn't going over the top on the first day of the summer and coming out of the line next day. This is going over the top, staying in the line, still in danger, going out to rest in your rest camp. You can have more people killed in your rest camp than you do in the front line. You're never away. The best you could hope for is a couple of days at Imbros. That is the best you can hope for you 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 you're just stuck there you're trapped what's the only way out gary what is the only way out from gallipoli death or injury frankly it's 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 a a a, a terrible thing now this this next quote is uh from and it sums up though the 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 British way. And this is 2nd Lieutenant Rupert Westmacott. He's, he's in the Auckland Battalion, New Zealand and Australian Division. Uh, but he, he'd, be, he'd come across to, uh, to Helles. And it, it's just a most fantastic quote. It, it does fit. Gary, this will come as a shock to you. Did you know that First World War veterans sometimes swore? No. I'm sorry, Gary. I know you think of them as plaster saints and you know revere them, but this is this is what Wes McCott said to my colleague who interviewed him. Uh, I got into this shell hole. I heard these two men talking, and one of them said, "I, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know what the, what the matter is with me." And the other one said, "I know. It's what the newspapers call demoralised. Fucking well demoralised." And that after. <laughs> That's the British Army for you, isn't it? And I always find a way to somehow swear about it and in a way have a laugh about it. Um, that, that, so that's conditions at Gallipoli. I ought to point out that, that they then, that we've looked at the conditions and then winter comes and the great storm. Now we did a whole podcast about that for Matt and that's, uh, you can listen to Matt McLachlan Living History to hear what we had to say about that. Uh, I think we covered that very well. But conditions at Gallipoli made it a special place. It was a place that they never forgot. They, they, wherever they, People would say it was worse than the Western Front. Did they mean the fighting? No, not really. Because <laughs> when they got to the Western Front, they couldn't believe the shelling at all. <gasps> the Germans' shelling was... Um, that, like The Turks didn't shell much. They didn't have many shells. They didn't have many guns. No, it's the conditions. It's the it's the the stress. It's the it's the constantly shitting themselves. It's it's the just the lack of water, the lack of sleep, the lack of anything. Just awful, unending, unending grind, suffering, danger. That was Gallipoli. That was Gallipoli. Terrible. All set against the backdrop, of course, of never achieving the objectives that were set on that first day. So no, no release of no success. Release, no success. You know, the 57th Battle of Crithia, uh, no doubt, <laughs> takes place fairly soon. And just, you know, repeating the same mistakes and not even having that release of, of achieving what you set out to do. Now, I believe, Gary, you advised me not to mention our Gallipoli tours after this podcast. <laughs> I think your words were, no, nah, Pete, don't mention that. <laughs> I, don't think, uh, I don't think the idea of <laughs> shitting themselves on the tour bus will be uh, their idea of fun. Let me assure you that none of that happens now. It's now a lovely place to visit. And you might get a little bit of upset, Tommy, if you're unlucky, but it only lasts a day and you can take Imodium, as Gary did, by the ton. <laughs> So we we definitely won't mention Gallipoli Tours. Is that agreed, Gary? No, I wouldn't mention Gallipoli Tours, Pete, no, at all. right. We, we'll not mention them. But if you want to go on a Gallipoli Tour, come with us. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you next week. ta yeah. Cheers, Pete.